Hello, and welcome to the fourth and final lecture of the Indian case study uh, for the Who Do You Think You Are module. This week, we're going to be picking up where we finished last time um, towards the end of the Second World War. And before we focus specifically on how Indian politics and society changed, we need a global background to explain the things that are happening in the mid 40s and early 50s. So after the Second World War finished, it became obvious that the old world system that was dictated to by colonial and imperial policy was no longer feasible. The actions of Germany, Japan and Italy had morally repulsed much of the world, but it also drew attention to the hypocrisy of countries such as Britain um, and France, who had equally as tried to dictate the economy and politics of other countries throughout the world. Now, to replace colonialism and imperialism, new forms of controlling the economy and world systems were created. And in the West, generally speaking, the capitalist model was um, taken up. And the biggest proponent was America, which had remained quite powerful despite World War II, unlike the European countries, which were severely weakened and America put political pressure on the Western European countries to give freedom to their colonial territories. Now, the opposite world system that was proposed after the Second World War was communism, which was adopted in, in Russia and lots of East um, Asian countries, as well as some countries throughout Africa as well. And in this new world system, America and Europe funded democratic countries and Russia and China funded communist movements. So it's important to understand that that's the context in which India was working in the development of this new world order as it has been labeled. And it is after the end of the Second World War that you get huge liberation movements taking place in Asia and Africa in particular, where countries had traditionally been owned by European countries. I've listed some of them on this timeline here. And one of the first countries that experienced a really strong nationalist and independence push for freedom was India. But it is not just the new world system that is important. And there had always been movements in India for independence. What is really, really important in the actual granting of freedom to the Indian people is the change in British politics after the Second World War had finished. Traditionally, Britain had been dominated by conservative governments who had driven an imperial agenda. And when you think of who was in charge during the Second World War, Winston Churchill had been openly racist towards the Indian people and refused to give them any sort of intervention during the crises of the early 40s. And that attitude of Churchill towards empire and colonial subjects had really acted as a catalyst for some of the nationalist movements. But after the Second World War had finished, in 1945, there was a general election. And it was widely considered that Churchill would win easily. He was seen by many to be a hero for his role in the victory in World War II. However, this complacency led to a disastrous campaign for the Conservatives. And out of nowhere, really, Clement Attlee and the Labour Party were voted in. And Clement Attlee had been a proponent for Indian um, independence for many decades by this point. He was a strong and passionate believer that colonies should be granted their own freedom. 
but also there's a lot of support for freedom of the colonies because Britain simply couldn't afford to maintain and run the lots of parts of the empire. And if people in their territories wanted freedom, there wasn't the desire to stop them anymore. But in India itself, a number of events following the finish of the Second World War also inspired um, lots of people to turn against the British. So you have this perfect condition, the perfect conditions for independence to take place. In November 44, 1945, you have something that is called the Red Fort Trials. And I mentioned in the last lecture that tens of thousands of Indian supporters joined what is known as the Indian National Army, which joined Japan and Germany in the fight against the British, hoping that Germany and Japan and the Axis powers would win World War II and then India would be granted independence. After Germany and Japan had lost the war, however, the British were furious at what they saw as the traitors in the Indian National Army. And they led um, a campaign and a series of trials against uh, the Indian National Army members, the first of which took place in uh, the Red Fort, which is in Old Delhi. And what was really interesting about this was it was white people in a Mughal temple. So the Mughals we discussed in the first lecture, trying Indian nationals as traitors to the emperor. And this caused a lot of controversy and bad blood. And actually, Britain had to reduce the sentences of lots of the people they trialed in an attempt to gain um, some sort of popularity. And this really highlighted the changing dynamic. Britain didn't have the same stranglehold it had over the Indian nation that it had previously had before the World War Wars. The uh, power dynamics were changing drastically. Then early in the next year, in February 1946, and in part a response to the trials that were taking place, Britain started to lose control of the Indian Navy. Now, the na there'd been some discontent in the Indian Navy for some time. And in many ways, these issues stem from back in the Sepoy Rebellion, where members, Indian nationals who were in the British Army were not given the same quality resources or living conditions. And discontent had been rising throughout the World War. And you begin to get naval rioting, disobedience and outright rebellion happening in um, across 78 ships and involving 20,000 soldiers. They uh, took control of the ships, refused to listen to often their white superiors. Now, this ended up in eight people dying, 33 people being wounded and 476 caught marshals. Now, this rebellion was actually condemned by the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, who were the two most important political parties in India at the time. However, it still marked an important turning point and that people were becoming increasingly um, insistent on independence. And it became really obvious with Attlee being elected, the pressure from America and the growing national uh, sentiment in India that independence was on its way. Now, the problem that happens when colonial powers leave a country, there is a power vacuum and multiple groups want to take control. And the two main groups who I've mentioned a few times in this lecture and the previous one, uh, the two main political groups in India were the Indian National Congress, which was pre predominantly made up of Hindus and Sikhs. And one of the most famous people of the Indian National Congress was Gandhi, who really were proponents of peaceful protests and took part in something called the Quit India movement, where they were asking Britain to simply leave. 
On the other hand, and in stark contrast to the peaceful methods of the Indian National Con uh, Congress, was uh, the Muslim League led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who rejected both British rule, but also calls for a united and peaceful India. The concern for Ali and Ali Jinnah and many other Muslims in India was that once the British had left, they would become a minority group within Indian society and their needs would be forgotten about. And whilst they initially agreed to a 1946 uh, cabinet meeting in India to the terms of a three tier structure after the British left, it became obvious they were not enthusiastic about a united India and wanted a separate Muslim majority country in the Northwest. And you could also feel this sentiment in both Muslim and Hindu newspapers in the mid 1940s, both of which you led vicious propaganda campaigns against the other groups. And eventually, this in August, 1946. This leads to extreme tension and violence breaking out as it becomes clear the British are going to leave. And after initially agreeing to um, a peaceful transfer of power, the Muslim League, led by Jinnah, encouraged a day of strikes against a unified India. And what happens is something known as the Day of Direct Action, which descends into the week of long knives. And this leads to, it begins with large groups, tens of thousands of Muslims and Hindus all protesting. But then these large groups clash with each other. And in Calcutta, 4,000 people end up dying in a single day. 100,000 are left homeless in three days. And this leads to mass migrations, which cause enormous problems, food shortages and further violence. And famously, Jinnah declares that we do not want war. If you want war, we accept your offer unhesitatingly though. We will either have a divided India or a destroyed India. And this was the passionate sentiments of lots of Muslims in this time period. Now, Attlee, Clement Attlee, the Labour Prime Minister of Britain, is deeply disturbed and concerned by developments in India. And he sends a committee to try and stabilise the, uh, the political climate before independence can happen. And he sends a really important man called Prince Louis of Mountbatten to try and restore peace. And he proposes that there's a two year planning stage divided um, where peaceful transfer can be slowly introduced. However, um, Prince Louis quickly realises that this is not going to happen. And the political tension that is happening is not going to be able to be reduced by British influence. And whilst he guarantees a peaceful transition, he decides to make it over six months, that it's not worth Britain's time and resources to try and draw the process out. What is agreed by Mountbatten and the various politicians of India are six main features of independence. And they are as follows, that in British India will be divided into two different countries. India, primarily comprised of Hindus and Sikhs, and then Pakistan, where Muslims could live and have their own autonomy. There would be a partition of contested provinces such as Bengal and Punjab between the two countries. That each country would have their own governor general to help rule as representatives of the crown. And that the princely system that I mentioned last week could choose to join either India or Pakistan, whoever they preferred. And really importantly, the title emperor of India was to be abolished. The British influence would be wiped from Indian society. And that was one of the most popular things that both sides agreed on. Now, they'd 
after centuries of many Indian groups trying to gain independence, finally it was about to happen. However, because of the change proposition of a two year transfer of power to six months, the process was rushed. Um, and what happens is the divide between the different countries is really rapidly done. And it's done usually by white British people and lawyers who didn't understand the complex regional politics of India, of which we've spoken a lot about, which are so difficult to summarize quickly, but they essentially draw very crude lines between different communities. And what happens is you get huge amounts of Hindus and Sikhs left in what is going to be Pakistan. And you get enormous amounts of Muslims left in what will be Hindu and Sikh India. So you get a mass migration of people trying to move to the country that represents their culture and religion most. And when I say large amounts of people, I mean 14 and a half million people are forced to migrate in a very short period of time. They have to leave their houses, their communities, take their possessions and try to get across where the borders will be. Now, as you can imagine, this leads to absolute chaos. There is widespread violence, looting, uh, robbery and unfortunately extreme sexual violence um, against hundreds of thousands of women. There are cases of infanticide and the murder of pregnant women as well. The country descends into anarchy in large parts, especially across these new Radcliffe lines. Um, it is difficult to work out the exact death toll because of the chaos that ensued. The British government suggests it's around 20,000. However, that is probably because they want to reduce the impact of what had happened. And it is, depending on who you believe, the actual death toll is probably between half a million and one million Indian nationals, which is a devastating tragedy. And what is awful to see is that Cyril Radcliffe, who was one of the leading people who drew the lines, admitted that he drew them so quickly because of his dislike for the heat of the Indian climate. If they had actually spent the time to work out the deeply relig divided religious communities, there would almost certainly have been much less bloodshed. So a mixture of British administrative incompetence that led to mass migrations and the deeply divided uh, local religious and political communities creates this perfect storm after the partition of India. And these divisions and lack of care in the Radcliffe line still cause um, issues over the next few decades. In 1971, you get a further partition during the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War. Now, if you look at the map on the top right of your screen, you can see that Pakistan was originally divided into West Pakistan and East Pakistan with India in between them, which was a logistic and administrative nightmare to try and rule. But East Pakistan, as I've mentioned before in previous lectures, is um, the area of Bengal, which is very culturally different from other Muslim areas and was historically looked down upon in the caste system. And independence movements gain in East Pakistan um, for their own independence from the Muslim dominated West Pakistan. And what happens in the 1970s, West Pakistan essentially begins a civil war, a brutal and systematic um, oppression of East Pakistan, which has been identified by uh, various bodies as a genocide. 30 million people in East 
um, in what is now modern day Bangladesh flee over the border into India for safety. And as we've discussed, these mass migrations cause chaos. But even within Bangladesh, um, forgetting about the oppression from West Bangladesh, you have a borderline civil war between Bengalis and Urdu-speaking Biharis as well. So it is this really complicated system, but Bangladesh eventually gains its independence. And even now, um, you get the reverberations of the Radcliffe line and the divisions of Indian society. And I'm kind of going to finish a summary of the whole four lectures and case study through the um, case of Kashmir, which kind of highlights all the main features of what we've been discussing over these four lectures. Kashmir is in North India. It borders modern day Pakistan, India and China. And it is essentially divided between Pakistan and India, but it causes an enormous amount of tension where these exact borders are. Now, Kashmir was originally a Hindu and Buddhist majority area in the mountainous regions of the north. Akbar, who I highlighted to you in the first lecture, used the internal divisions of this area to his advantage and incorporated it into the Mughal Empire, where he allowed the different religions to practice their theology. Eventually, under the East India Company, power is transferred to Sikh rulers who were in that area um, loyal to the East Indian Company and led anti-Muslim policies despite a now Muslim majority. This Kashmir sided with Brit Britain during the Sepoy Rebellion of 1857 and was made a princely state. However, eventually during the partition of India, as it was a Muslim majority um, area, it was anticipated that Kashmir would become part of Pakistan, but large parts of it remain under Indian control. And this led to an Indian-Pakistan war in 1965. And as recently as, um, oh, before I go on to that, you can see how difficult the boundary situation is. And this is a brilliant image from Kashmir, where the boundary is literally painted on in the middle of a bridge over a river. So you can see how difficult it is to deal with these issues. And as recently as February the 6th, Pakistan are still putting out official statements with regards to national policy on Kashmir. So all these regional debates that we're talking about, the Radcliffe line, Britain's um, role in the administration of the partition, they are as relevant now as they have ever been. And India remains a largely divided society by ethnicity, class, colonial overthrows. Um, so there is still no easily defined Indian national identity. So I'm just going to leave the conclusion for this particular session on here so you can pause it, make notes about the main points I want you to take away. For the seminar, I want you to think about five main questions. Firstly, what were the main reasons Britain granted India independence after World War II had finished? I've listed some, but there are other uh, reasons that you possibly can find in your reading. Secondly, why were the Muslim League so aggressively against a united India? Um, it wasn't enough that Britain were removed, they wanted their own country. Thirdly, were the British the main factor behind the violence seen in the petition of India, or was it other groups and other factors? Fourthly, what could have been done differently to ensure a more peaceful transfer and efficient transfer of power? And the fifth question I want you to think about, which kind of rather than just spans this lecture, but all of them, is was India more or less divided at the start of the Mughal period 
or at the end of British rule. Now, there's obviously no right or wrong answer to that. I'd just be interested to see your thinking. And then finally, I want you to read uh, the journal article Dimensions and Dynamics of Violence During Partition of India, because I'm going to be talking about that quite a lot. It's volume 74, um, and that is available on JSTOR, pages 909 to 920. Um, and that is the end of this case study. I look forward to talking to you in more detail about the various lectures in the seminars. Thank you.